Hello, everyone. Welcome to TIFF Next Wave Presents, a conversation with Devery Jacobs and Defera Wunitai on reservation paths. As you join us today, we encourage you to reflect on the land that you're on and its history. I'm located on the treaty lands and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. The territory is within the lands and protected by the Dish with One Spoon Land from Belt Covenant and is home to many First Nations like the Inuit and the Métis people. We are grateful to work on this land and to create a space for Indigenous filmmakers and creators at TIFF. My name is Dev and I'm a member of the TIFF Next Wave Committee, a group of 12 dedicated and socially engaged teen film enthusiasts, many of whom are young creators and filmmakers in Toronto. I would like to extend a thank you to our lead sponsor, Bell, and our major sponsors, RBC and Visa, as well as our major supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto, as well as a huge thanks to our community partner for today's event, Imaginative. I would also like to thank the Sean Mendez Foundation for their generous support to TIFF Next Wave. We can't wait to welcome all of you to this year's TIFF Next Wave Festival, which will take place from April 22nd to April 24th in person at TIFF Bell Lightbox and online on digital TIFF Bell Lightbox. The TIFF Next Wave Festival is Canada's largest film festival programmed by youth for youth, and Next Wave audiences includes young and emerging filmmakers, creators, and actors who are just starting out in the industry and navigating what it means to bring their unique stories to the screen. Through, through Next Wave, we strive to empower, educate, and amplify the rising voices. For more information about the festival, please visit tiff.net slash nextwave. We have some exciting announcements about this year's festival lineup coming up in March. Now, Reservation Dogs, set and filmed in rural Oklahoma, is a comedic coming of age series about four indigenous teenagers who go on a minor crime spree in order to fund their dream of moving to California. With a cast and crew made up almost entirely of indigenous people, the show brings viewers into a world that Television 2 rarely visits. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's host, Radion Simon Pillay. Radion Simon Pillay is the acting editor at Now Magazine, the film critic for the national breakfast show Your Morning on CTV, and the pop culture columnist for CBC Syndicated Radio. He also has a Friday Flicks segment on CTV News Channel and contributes to The Guardian. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's such a pleasure to host this conversation about Reservation Dogs, which was my favorite show of the year. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about the series. Reservation Dogs is uh, co-created by Sterling Harjo and Taika Waititi. It's part of an exciting new wave of film and TV projects by Indigenous creators who are finding power in their own storytelling traditions. It's radical. It's hilarious. It's full of heart. Uh, it features standout performances from so many Indigenous actors, including our guests. Devery Jacobs and DeFerro Wunatai, both of whom, by the way, have been on the cover of Now Magazine. Um, you know, I'm just going to list off a lot, a bunch of their achievements here. Like Devery Jacobs was born and raised in Ganawage Mohawk Territory. Her acting credits include features such as Rhymes for Young Ghouls and the upcoming Bootlegger, uh, as well as hit series like The Order and American Gods. Uh, and Devery was named a TIFF Rising Star at the 2018 Toronto International Film Festival. And she's currently starring as Alora Dannon on Reservation Dogs. And alongside acting, Devery's other passion lives in Indigenous rights activism. Uh, most recently, Devery has been focusing her activism through her art, hoping to create change within communities and to alter the perspective of how Indigenous people are seen. Deferro Wunatai is a 20-year-old OG Cree First Nations actor. He starred in Tracy Deer's widely acclaimed film, Beans, which premiered at TIFF in 2020 and has since gone on to win a bunch of accolades around the world, including Best Motion Picture at the 2021 Canadian Screen Awards. He currently stars as Bear in Reservation Dogs and is busy studying his native language, Ojibwe. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's bring in Devery and DeFerro. Devery, DeFerro, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this conversation. And I mean, you both know how much I love Reservation Dogs. It's such an exciting show. And um, I mean, before we talk about that, though, I do want to talk about what came before Reservation Dogs. Because, you know, I feel like for a lot of people, Reservation Dogs will be kind of their, the, the first time they, they're introduced to Indigenous-led content. And I think it's important to talk about, like, like you know, it's not like it came out of nowhere. There was a real buildup and accumulation of different creators, Indigenous creators, who who kind of fought to get this kind of space on television. You know, people who, who A, told their own stories, fought to get their own stories sold, fought for the space to get there. Uh, Devery, I mean, you've been sort of part of this movement for at least a decade now. So, I mean, just tell, tell, uh, tell it from your perspective. Like, I mean, wh where do you see, like, who who do we need to shout out to before we got to Reservation Dogs? 
Oh my God, there's so many people, not only from like my generation growing up, but also like people who came far before us who have been fighting to have our stories be on screen and be heard, especially in a landscape such as film that has like, I don't know, a history of only misrepresentation and blackface and red face and every, every um, culture who they were trying to represent hadn't been a part of storytelling on screen before. So I'd say before us there, I mean, people even still hear people, trailblazers like Tantu Cardinal and Graham Greene and Gary Farmer and just so many people who've come before us uh, who are still working today. And yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a long time coming. And the fact that Reservation Dogs has had a place um, and has happened in 2021 is, amazing but also kind of embarrassing that mm -hmm. it's taken this long to get here mm -hmm. DeFaro, is there anyone you wanted to add to that list in terms of who paved the way for this moment yeah i mean like native people have been in really have been in film since kind of film started you know what i mean like well we've always been playing in the backgrounds and i'm talking about majority of times when they would have uh native story storytellers would be uh, not native people playing them. And the ma majority of the times, the real native people were being the ones who were getting shot off the horses, right? So like, really, you wanna have to get a shout out to the really, in a sense, unknown name people who didn't, who like, you know, who who um, who put up with the misrepresentation just so they can get some money, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just so they can fight for their family, you know? And like, be a part of this industry, which they probably did love, you know? And so that's been going on since the silent era, you know? So that's like, since the beginning, so. Shout out to every single person who's put up with all that bullshit for us to me, Devery, Paulina, all of us to actually, you know, be proud of what we did instead of just, you know, not, you know, adding on to that whole, that whole, that whole thing. Yeah, I love that. I love like shouting out the people who had no choice but to, if they wanted to be part of this industry, they had to be part of a John Ford Western or whatnot, right? Like the, the, those are the names we don't sing about. And then also, I mean, just to add, like you know, in terms of the Canadian film landscape, I mean, there's Zacharias Canuck, there's Alanis Abamsawin, right? There are these filmmakers who blaze that trail, and even. I mean, I would say, like, if we look at this current moment, I mean, we have Reservation Dogs. We also have a film like Night Raiders. You know, Night Raiders is directed by Danis Goulet. And it's, it's important to think about how Danis Goulet, before she got to make this film, she was an executive director at Imaginative, you know, this film festival that was curating all these, like, all these international voices, all these indigenous voices from all over the world together, you know, and they all met. At, in that imaginative, you know, like Sterling Harjo, the creator of Reservation Dogs, Taika Waititi, uh, Dennis Goulet, these are all their crew from these kinds of festivals, right? And now they're having this moment. And I love how they're, they're kind of, I love that they created this community and they're all bringing each other up. And it, I mean, how does that look on your end when you're seeing this sort of community of talents that are just all of a sudden rising together? Debra, Can you I go, go first? No, oh, sure. Go go for it. Go for it. Yeah, My yeah. apologies. No, okay, okay. Yeah. Fine then. What's it called? No, um, go. <laughs> Um, you know, it's actually really beautiful to see how, how long Reservation Dogs was in the process. You know what I mean? Like you can see tracings of, of, of Reservation Dogs in Sterling's old work with 1491s. So many different like scenes that were taken out of 1491s and applied to Reservation Dogs. Um, but also just when I first got to meet, uh, big shout out. First of all, I got to meet uh, Bird Running Water. That was like the coolest thing because that's like the guy who, in my eyes, put it all together. You know, what I mean, he he ran the indigenous indigenous program at Sunset, and then that's where like uh, Sydney Freeland, Sterling Harjo, all of them got to meet up together and like you know and 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 interact and build those connections. You know, so that's been going on for a very long time since the early two thousands when I was a little baby. You know, so you know, <laughs> it's amazing. You know, and it's amazing to be also be a part of telling this story, knowing that this has been going on for a while, you know. Yeah. No, totally. There have been uh, so many filmmakers from Sundance, from Imaginative, like, like you said, shout out to Sydney Freeland, to Black Horse Low, to Jeff Barnaby, who gave me my start, um, and to all these filmmakers who came up and kind of had to do guerrilla filmmaking and kind of had to work on projects without the support of the masses like we're experiencing now with res dogs um and straight up like so many of these filmmakers had been told like your project will never sell because people aren't interested in native stories and and i think by having a show like reservation dogs become so successful and so long overdue it's it's showing the film industry that we have such funny hilarious heartwarming and heartbreaking stories um that we 
have just been waiting to waiting to tell and and so many different genres and artistic perspectives within it like it's we have to be at the beginning like this has to be the beginning because there's just there's so much to tell yeah I, I remember um when I interviewed you so long ago uh, I remember you were like you know like I get to play all these badass characters and I blame Jeff Barnaby because of Brian <laughs> for Young Ghouls right and and in some ways like your character uh, it, it, you know, Alora is pretty badass too, right? Is this like a natural extension, this role of like the, the entire canon of, of Devry Jacob roles? I don't say it would be the entire canon, but yeah. I mean, it's an honor to be able to play Alora and to be playing like these badass characters because I'm just like way more derpy in real life. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> don't nod to Pharaoh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I just, okay, I'm sitting back. Like, no, I'm just kidding. kidding. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so I, I would say that um, playing a Laura Dan and uh, while she's also like a tough girl role, there's also something really specific about her and something that was really infused in my life was like being a big sister. And I really feel that she, that Alora Dan in, in Res Dogs is very much to that, to Bear, to Willie Jack, to Cheese. Um, yeah, and it's just been like so awesome to be able to play that with y'all and, and for us to gear into season two. <laughs> hey, you know what like before we get too deep into this i wanted i, I want to i want you all both, both to remember or go back to when you first heard the title reservation dogs like what was your first kind of contact with this was it the title was it a script or a pilot or a log line like when you first heard that what was your reaction or what was your hopes of what it could be or what was your worries that what it might turn into you know like well yeah like what was going on in your head there you got something go. you go first you can go first <laughs> Um, sure. Um, when I first heard of Res Dogs, obviously I thought of Reservoir Dogs, which is uh, a play on that. And having looked through the project and looking looking at like the character breakdown and also the the breakdown of the whole series, for me, because I've been a fan of Taika Waititi's for so long, it really reminded me of um, of his 2010 film Boy. Um, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. And, but it felt like the native American version of that. And, um, and so I was just like, so psyched and couldn't believe that that was happening. And, and the collaboration of indigenous folks from like across the globe working on this together. So I was just like, I knew the potential of what it could be. Um, but it was just a pilot. We didn't know if it was going to be picked up or not. So it kind of felt like a, potential big moment but one that we had to do right mm -hmm. what about you bear or bear i called him bear see how I can say <laughs> bear. <laughs> well i mean the exact same thing happened well sort of like the first time i read the um read the title i seen i seen how it was a play on words of uh reservoir dogs and i kind of like really started um you know i kind of connected with it right off the bat i knew they were going to make references all throughout the all throughout the show which they do you know and a lot of tarantino references in, 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 in a lot of his films um when i first got the script for the edition well i didn't even get the script yet i just got the edition it was like two scenes four pages two pages each scene you know and like right off the bat like i felt so connected with 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 bear i mean i think i think the first scene was with him and his mom in the pilot um inside the washroom and um i was like Damn, this is like my actual mom. <laughs> like, like, this is so weird. You know? <laughs> and and, and, and uh, I think the other scene too was, um, I think it was the ending. I think it was an. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. The point is, I felt really connected right off the bat with him. And then when I got the script, I was just like, I was pretty shocked on, on, on how 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 similar it was to my life, even though we're so far away from. Even though you can see differences, obviously, in the script with you know Oklahoma and Toronto, where I'm born and raised, but there's. There's a lot of similarities, and that's why, like, I knew we we're doing something right. You know what I mean? Like, like I, someone could be so far away from that community, but yet there's so many uh, similarities, and then like we can uh, relate on with each other. Um, exactly the same thing. I knew it was a pilot, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know if it was gonna go anywhere or not. I mean, I know that a lot of indigenous people, indigenous storytellers, doors were closed on them. You know, so I was maybe expecting that would be the exact same thing. You know. And like you can see that in television even more recently so it's like so i i didn't like i didn't know what was going to happen with it I, I seen how there was a big name like taika attached to it and i did see when i read the script that there, it did seem very similar to boy and which i which was a really good uh, favorite film of mine of taika's um 
but yeah, exactly. I didn't know what to come out of it. You know, I had a lot of hope. And I, I had a lot of, see, that came right after we, f I filmed a project called Beans. And that project was really close to me because when I first read that, uh, seen the title of the description of like talked about the Oka crisis, I knew that like actually sh stuff was changing in this industry and we can actually talk about serious stuff and important facts of Canadian history and, and indigenous history. You know, so I was really proud to even read that that was happening. And the fact that the next project was this was like, like this game's changing a little bit, you know, and I'm being a part of it. It's an amazing feeling. You know, you both talk very fondly of sort of the audition process or, you know, like, uh, you know, when when you got together. And I'm just curious, like, I mean, because when we talk about the need to have Indigenous creators tell Indigenous stories, I mean, it's not just about the authenticity of the story, but it's also about just taking care of people, even, in, I think, in the audition process. Was there anything you felt that was different about auditioning for, you know, Taika and Sterling versus other projects you might have been, you know, involved with? Can I go first? Yeah. Straight up, like, I was doing uh, Zoom, like Zoom editions, not even Zoom editions, like self tapes, because they were all doing in person tapes. I knew people from Toronto who flew down from Toronto to audition in person. I wish I did that. You know what I mean? I mean, hey, I, I still got the role, but still, like, you know, I wish <laughs> I did that. That'd be so cool. But like, but like, you know. Um, so I was doing a lot of over uh, um, self tapes. I wasn't really g getting interacting with Taika or, or Sterling, which I know Sterling was doing a lot of the. Uh, uh, additions um but he, they, they would give me feedback to say correct this correct this and i would do it the, the first time i actually did really get to meet sterling um was in the final audition process and where i got to meet devry for the first time too as well and me and my twin brother got to fly out for the first time in to la um and really just a quick part about that like i felt really like warm with it like it was like it was a good feeling it wasn't it wasn't i wasn't i didn't feel stressed out or like pre or like um scared you know, as soon as I walked in that room, all that fear kind of just disappeared. And Taika and Sterling, both that, that collaboration with both of them in that room, really, they knew how to um, calm an actor down, you know, and get him into the, get him and her, or her into the zone they need to be in, you know. And um, yeah, so that was my, that was my experience. Yeah. My was short there, story of the experience, really. <laughs> was there, was there a sense of community then? And I mean, uh, Deborah, you go ahead and uh, explain this, like, uh, like uh, just even among the people who didn't get the roles and stuff, like. Yeah, it was such a, it was unlike any audition experience that I have gone through where um, they had local Oklahoma casting um, from the jump and they were doing open casting, which is where Lane Factor um, was found by Sterling, but also where a lot of the Indian mafia, like the, our bad guy gang, uh, and where they had originally auditioned as well, uh, actors like Xavier, actors like Elva Guerra, uh, who plays Jackie. Um, and so having them be a part of it, and then obviously myself, um, your twin brother, Mede, uh, DeFaro, and Paulina, we, we were kind of the actors who had come from the North, and we all met in L.A., and this was the first time like meeting each other and uh, except obviously DeVero and Paulina were practically brother and sister from working on Beans before. Um, but we all had the chance to like hang out and also to like have lunch together. We were together for like six hours at a table waiting nervously in the space for Taiga to come and for us to, to see each other. But um, Sterling was really, as a person, he's already really disarming and is someone who is just like immediately likable and and people just want to be around and and be friends with but he also really put us at ease and and had said like even if you're not cast in one of the four roles like you're still going to be a part of this project in some way because they're so we're building a world and there's going to be so many characters and and he really did keep his word like all of the actors minus your brother because he like shares a face with you since he's your twin <laughs> but uh Almost everybody um, has now had a part in, in Red Dogs and has become part of the show and, and the world that we've built. So I thought that was just something that was so, so like honorable. And Sterling just has like such a strong sense of community wherever he goes and, and makes sure that everybody's involved on, on every, on every level. Um, so it's just been, it's been wild to see. I honestly, before this experience, didn't know that community and industry could like coexist at the same time yes yeah, so look look like when we talk about when we talk about uh the authenticity the show brings i mean obviously there's the authenticity of like 
hey, like, you know, we're not we're not misrepresenting indigenous people. But there's also I think there's little details. And DeFerro, you and I talked about you. You mentioned how like, oh, my God, they have orange crush, <laughs> which is like, exactly what I drink. Right. And and I don't know, Debbie, do you drink orange crush? Is that your flavor? I don't really um, drink no, orange crush. No. No. But, are, yeah. but OK, so that, are there other <laughs> details in this show? Where you're like, oh my god, that is my fan. That is exactly what they do. Never mind that this is Muskogee versus like, well, what are the? Give me some of those details, those tidbits. Like, what's what's the one that blew you away? Like, that's my fan. For me, I think it's just like all the aunties and uncles and community members and like Mos and Miko and the sense of like community and gossip and like family extending beyond blood. That was like the element that was really reflective of like my community and and how I grew up, where it was like this could be this could be Gunawage, except like everybody is speaking with southern accents. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I would say kind of like the whole exactly the whole idea of like kinship, like like you know like the whole aunties and uncles <clears throat> dynamic. It's just so similar. It's actually really beautiful to see on screen. You know. Uh, th oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, did you have something else to add to that? Defer? Okay. Um. Well, I mean, like, what, okay, look. I mean, in, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say another thing that like really stood out to me, which I think is kind of like reflective of all indigenous stories, like across Turtle Island, but also the world is like our connection to like our legends and stories where like, of course it makes sense that like it's a comedy, but then we also have really dramatic moments. And then there's also the deer lady running around in Bigfoot. Like, of course those things coexist because that's how we see the world. Um, and so that was also something that really like translated to my community. And it also helped that like the deer woman was actually from Gunawage, played mm -hmm. by Gunyet Dio Horn. <laughs> oh, amazing. Hoof lady, deer lady, just different locations. Yeah. You know, you know, um, what I love about this show, what, one of the things that there's so much I love about this show, but one of the things I loved is like, you know, you're, you're mixing in the deer lady and the big hoof, uh, Bigfoot and, 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 and different indigenous lores and beliefs and customs and stuff, but you're, and you're mixing it in with pop culture. Like you all mentioned how, Hey, it's called reservations dogs. It's a playoff reservoir dogs. There's, there's visual nods to platoon. There's hip hop. There's all these things, right? There's a reason I love that so much. I mean, actually like, I mean, w I mean, did, do you have any initial thoughts on that? Just the way the show plays on pop culture and, and how it engages with the culture at lar large and doesn't feel siloed in any way? Mm. Well, I mean, again, we're, we're in pop culture, you know what I mean? Like, right. like, like human beings, like, you know what I mean? Like, like we love Tupac and everyone else, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it makes sense, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I think it's also like having grown up in marginalized communities and marginalized cultures like we didn't have indigenous stories in the mainstream to look up to but there were like hip-hop artists and rappers and and like a lot of from black culture is is something that like especially in my community like Mohawk folks and indigenous folks everywhere like connected to that that even though our experiences were different and we came from different cultures there was still uh, a beauty that we really appreciated in that and also, like, being, uh, like, all of the pop culture references throughout Res Dogs is, like, Sterling and Taika being fanboys and, like, loving, I don't know, martial arts movies, like, Bruce Lee movies growing up and just, like, being such a fan. And, and the fact that, like, there haven't been super nerdy Native characters before, if you look at, like, Lane Factor playing Cheese, I'm like, I have so many cousins who are just like Cheese, and we haven't got to see any of them before on screen, so I think it's just, like, love of the things that you loved growing up and of pop culture, and, like, we want to have fun shows and movies, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, first of all, like, I mean, and that, what you mentioned about um, Sterling and Taika being, like, movie geeks, I mean, that reminds me, of course, of Barnaby as well, who is, yeah. like, you know, like... Uh, of all these different kind of genre movies and stuff like that right um and uh, and again because okay, so i i do want to I, I love how like you know like the fact that the, the empathy you find with different forms of art from different communities marginalized communities coming together and stuff the other thing i mean the reason i was also latching onto the pop culture thing is like you know it, it's, it's so often uh, i think it was michael gray eyes that said that you know anytime he got cast he got cast in movies that take place in the past you know, they take place during like the during call the early times of colonization, just basically during genocide, or he gets cast in post apocalyptic fair where like that's the only way people imagine a, an indigenous person like Michael Greyas. They never imagine you in the present. 
You know, they never imagine you engaging with pop culture, being part of this moment, sharing this space. And it, it just feels so like telling like, oh, like, you know, the, the, the settler creators cannot imagine sharing space with indigenous people now they have to pit them in the past or in the future so that's why a show like reservation dogs where you guys are here now engaging with this culture just felt so much more powerful for that reason i, don't, I mean do you have any thoughts on that or like i agree with you <laughs> that just went off on my <laughs> monologue <right? laughs> i mean like you, you notice that pattern as well about like where they love to silo indigenous people it's like it's always always off to the corner so to speak in terms of like where they situate characters yeah, they typecast us, you know, I mean, they have like a certain mindset of what we're supposed to be like, you know, how we're supposed to act like, look like, you know, so, totally. yeah. yeah. I, I've had, after Rhymes for Young Ghouls, I had moved to New York and that had been my first experience working with an Indigenous writer director and I emerged into the industry thinking like, this is what it's going to be like and everything's going to, everything's going to change and I was in for like a very rude awakening and even from five years ago like it's a completely different industry now than it was back in the day when when people didn't value indigenous stories and and really only thought of us as historic like extinct people um and so i emerged into an industry that was only looking for like pocahontas type characters and the indian maiden and and things like that so i distinctly remember telling my agents i'm like if i'm gonna do a sex scene it's not gonna be in buckskin and it's not gonna be in a bed of furs like this this just isn't how it is for me and i didn't want it to center around like white colonizer stories and and so i think that now is now that we're stepping into positions of power and now that we're behind the scenes and a part of the creation of our own stories, that's why it's so much more powerful to see us in modern day life and living how we live now as opposed to being romanticized or or reduced to two-dimensional characters. Um, so yeah, like I definitely agree with you and and yeah, it's been, it's it's a really exciting time to be a part of and again one that's long overdue yeah you sorry i and i also remember when you used to have to act in you know sort of like indigenous stories told by settler filmmakers when you mentioned something you mentioned how there's a certain labor you were not paid for where you had to be the cultural consultant on the set right it's because you're the and it's like it's like it's not that wasn't your job you're just an actor hire but you always have to protect these characters right so i mean i i guess that that's a huge journey from then and now i mean i, I guess you could say no to any of those kind of instances that happen now right or Sorry, I'm Sorry can saying. you say that one more time? Sorry, I mean, like, yeah, like, uh, whatever that sound was. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I mean, so like, I, I mean, do you find yourself having to do that labor now? Or I mean, actually, well, now you're, you're you've actually been tapped to be in the writer's room of Indigenous. Yeah, of, now uh, I'm paid for my now ideas. You're paid for your <laughs> like, I mean, like, like, talk to me about that, about like going from this to now. Hey, you're actually paid for your contributions here. I mean, I have to like give Sterling such a shout out and like huge Maro Nyamako, thank you for um all that he's done on the acting front, but also like I prepared for season two with the writer's room to, I got all my writing samples together and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a big case for myself to like go and and like plead my case to be allowed to like sit in and maybe shadow in the writer's room. Um, because even though I've, I've written for a while, it's been short films and features and never anything official. Um, and so, I was all prepared to to fight to the death. And I he was just like, yeah, you're more than welcome to come in. And so I was in the room contracted for four weeks, but then he ended up extending it to, to the whole time. And then now I'm actually uh, co-writing an episode with him for season two. So it's just been like, it makes me so full of gratitude to have had that experience and to like learn not only from Sterling, but from everybody in the writer's room and also being in a space where it's all indigenous folks from who I've known either forever or who I've just re met more recently. Um, but everybody's from varying degrees of experience. And so I felt really welcome to be able to come and like approach with my ideas. And, and so, yeah, I'm just like so psyched and grateful. And it's just been, it's like shout out to Sterling for giving myself a chance, but also like not necessarily taking a chance because he knows these people are talented and he knows what they're capable of. They just haven't been given their shot in the industry before. And that's, I think, 
what has made Reservation Dogs so unique is that it's it's from people who have finally been granted a sh their shot. Yeah, yeah. And, well, you know, like, I mean, and just, like, one more thing that, like, you know, what's striking about Reservation Dogs compared to what we had to put up with in the past, right? Like, when you, when you think about what we had to put up in the past, and I mean, like, uh, I'm thinking specifically of depictions of Indigenous trauma. You know, like, uh, and, and and I'll name a few. Like, you know, you think of movies like Indigenous Horse. You think of shows. You think of the stuff that's made by Taylor Sheridan, like Wind River or Hell or High Water, where there's like <laughs> these Indigenous characters that are made to suffer for the currency of white people. So white people can look sympathetic, or white people can, you know, uh, you know, like, or like, you know, they could show their heroism, right? Like, it's, you're it's, spilling some tea. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> that, well, I mean, am I wrong here? <laughs> like, nobody's saying say you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, and I mean, and I'm sure that that they're in Yellowstone too which I can't bring myself to watch because of the track record here right but um like <laughs> but, you know but so you talk to me because there's a huge difference between the way trauma is depicted in that kind of settler project versus how trauma is handled in reservation dogs and let me, uh, let yeah. me hear from you well like you know like like what you may have heard before like you know a lot of times our stories weren't, weren't being told unless they had you know a white savior dynamic going on you know what i mean like like films you kind of just listed off that i don't want to list off but like you know like 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 that you know and like those are the only things that were getting sold you know and a lot of traumatic stuff and this i actually want to connect this to what we talked about before which was um do people act, like do you have to have a feeling of like needing to teach people you know like a lot of times when i talk to people and they and they find out that, I, that i'm part indigenous they uh they automatically talk straight up like they know so much about like you know the uh, the residential school uh, uh, bodies being found you know and that's like the main topic like literally like f like ever since they've been discovered that's all everyone who's been talking to me about who like is not indigenous so they'll just come up to me like you know about the bodies and like all this shit's so terrible and like yeah yeah you know it's, it's interesting seeing um um it takes such a terrible thing for people to actually give a shit you know and mm. like how obvious it was you know i mean like children we knew children didn't come home you know what i mean but it's just like no one gave a shit you know so it was like until like until like oh my local church there's fucking babies bodies under there people actually started giving a shit so like you know um yeah that whole that whole thing but fucking sorry sorry that's the only conversation they want to have with you I'm yeah basically culture, yeah and, and right? that's their connection somehow. yeah that translates into the film dynamic you know what i mean they only want to see us they only want to talk and see us about what's traumatic about us because that's what's been taught in history you know what i mean like all the traumatic shit they just want to dive deeper into it it's this like weird thing that people like who are interested in the natives they like learning about the whole traumatic shit you know what i mean instead of like the good stuff that we have done you know what i mean and, and, and we're still here so there's like you know we did something good <laughs> you know what i mean like like yeah that's totally right and it's also like I almost feel like Western audiences sensationalize what's happened to us and like don't hold any of the nuance in our experiences. And so when handling trauma in Reservation Dogs, like we came at it from like uh, an honest perspective of how our communities have been impacted with issues like suicide and what we're dealing with throughout the show and how it ripples out, but that there's also like such such beauty in the community that comes together and mourns for for the people who we've lost and and I think that's part of the conversation that's been missing for so long is the is the beauty and also like the humor where I'll go to funerals in my community and like it's some of the funnest parties that I've been to or like it's you'll be sitting there with the people and it's like such a tangible connection. There's not a disconnect between life and death as there are in Western audiences, uh, audiences, but society um, where like we're there with our loved one who's passed and it's open casket. And we are like, you dress the body and you're also there with them all night and telling stories of stupid shit they did when they were young. Like it's a very hands on like three dimensional experience of, of like, everything everything in between and and i feel like that was something that we were able to tap into with res dogs um that is one of the elements of being from our cultures that hasn't been shown because we haven't been behind the camera and at the helm of the creative mm -hmm. well i mean then to talk about also just like i mean and i don't know if there's like a like a specific example here but like is there a huge difference when you're when you're when you're drawing on trauma for the sake of a settler creator versus for the sake of Sterling and Taika and the crew that they put together, you're within community, 
when you're making when you're when you're when you're shooting that big episode that you had every right like uh the like, the, the the flashback episode the driving sorry the driving lesson i mean you're you're there with surrounded by your community is there a difference in terms of how they handle it in terms of making sure you feel supported when you're handling that kind of material on set it's night and day and it's not we, we were making that for ourselves as opposed to making it for Western audiences. And like they had a, the elder Whitco there who like made sure that we smudged before and that we left that energy on set and that we were telling the story in a good way and that we weren't showing anything graphic um, because that's impacted so many of our communities. And it, it wasn't only Sterling's story. It's like all of us have been impacted by issues around suicide and losing loved ones and community members in some way. And so we all poured so much of ourselves into that, but also made sure that we held it with such care because, because it's, it's greater than just this story. And, and we know how sensitive it is for, for so many of our families and, and communities. So it, it was night and day. And, and that was like all of our stories in, in that episode. Um, and that's like, I can't even begin to describe how different that is with, than it would be like shooting with a, a non-Indigenous creative team. But I also don't, like, I do want to say I don't always want to compare like what it's like to work with a non-Indigenous team versus like what it is like, because I just kind of want to imagine moving forward, like where our stories can go and how they can strengthen and develop in like ways that we couldn't have even imagined in telling our stories, if if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I don't always want to be in relation to the white industry. I want us to like forge and create our own where it can stand alone and it can it can stand on its own. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do think like, I mean, the, I mean, and I guess the, the drawing on the comparison is because in a way, Reservation Dogs is showing us where it can go. Right. Because in a way, like. Like we mentioned all those examples of how trauma was depicted in the past. Well, in the in the past, trauma was the end game. Whereas in Reservation Dogs, Reservation Dogs is about healing. And everything, everything about this show is about healing, right? And I don't think any of those other previous examples got that. Um, so I and I mean, do you want to talk about the different ways this show is about healing from your from your perspective? Or you got one to fair? What do you mean exactly? Like, well, I mean, I think there's so many different ways the show's about healing, and we talked about maybe oh, the, the comedy. Yeah, the show, the comedy of it, the fact that it exists, like all of the different ways that this show is about healing or is healing in itself. Yeah, I mean, like, well, it, just a quick answer on that one. Like, we started the episode starts a year after our, our friend's our our brother's death, right? So it's like, like that's all of us are still in our our, our healing uh, process, you know, and you could see it with each individual character, you know, and how Bear takes it how Laura does, how everyone does, you know? And later on, you, you discover, as the audience, you discover, like, how Willie Jack's related to Daniel and, and you know, and the Laura Daniel and, and, and they were very close and and Daniel Daniel gave Cheese his name. You know what I mean? Like, it, there, was, there was so much more to it. Um, yeah, like, you know, the whole show's about healing. Like you said, it really is. You know I mean? Every, everything we did, you know, it's like, like, you know, perfect example is like the whole idea of us wanting to go to California that came from that came from Daniel you know what I mean so like we were always just trying to go do it for him that's like my eyes bears healing you know what I mean getting to California you know or at least thinking he is I don't know but yeah well and even <laughs> vice versa when when um Paulina's character decides to stay that's also to heal to help her community heal. her too, version right? yeah right um Debbie is there anything you want to add to that or yeah I'll share um a deleted scene with you, like a summary of a deleted scene where um, at the end of episode 107, uh, which is California Dreaming, which is the episode where Laura gets her driver's license. Um, it didn't end up working in the cut, but originally how it was written and what we shot uh, is after uh, Alora Dan and drops off Coach Bobson at his place and he gives her the license. She drives to the hideout and she drives to the same building um, where uh, where Daniel, um, where that had all happened. And she's there and she's sitting and she's contemplating. Um, and she looks over and she sees Daniel sitting beside her and he says, California. And she says, California. And that was a moment of her getting her license and like doing one step further to 
making it to the place that they had promised each other that they would go to and is a way of like Alora Dan and healing. Um, it didn't end up making it into the show because um, it ended up making it seem like Alora was leaving for California in that moment. Um, but it was like, even though it didn't make it to camera, the feeling and the fact that we shot that was like, it still fed our performances and still fed what we were doing moving forward. And, and like, even thinking about it, it makes me emotional because it's like, that's, that's such a big part of this, of this journey and what all these Riz Dogs are trying to do, even though it's a comedy, even though it's like a fun show that's like lighthearted and all of it, like it still comes down to healing and to mourning and mourning the loss of their friend while also celebrating his life. Mm -hmm. Perfectly said. And of course, like, I mean, uh, in terms of healing, we also should add that comedy. I mean, comedy is healing, right? <laughs> like, and the show is hilarious. Um, I mean, <laughs> like, listen, like, uh, I, I, um, I want to talk about season two. <laughs> I mean, and, and so now, uh, uh, Devery, like, spill the tea. Like, what can we expect? Where you said that, you know, you're more excited about where Indigenous storytelling is going. Where is it going? I mean, we're talking about healing, and I think that's something that definitely transfers over to season two. I can't, I don't know if I can, like, spill a whole lot. Um, Defer, we're going to have to have conversations, <laughs> and I'll <laughs> spill some tea. Um, I, I, I will say, though... <laughs> I will say, though, that if season one uh, featured a lot of Native uncles, that season two will be all about the aunties, um, which is personally like my experience growing up was being surrounded by Native aunties. And so I'm excited to um, to dive into that and to go into production on on season two, which we're going to start shooting in March. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, OK, so well, first of all, is the world of reservation dogs i mean you see the first season was about these these this group a lot of them wanting to get out spread out get to california and then a bunch of them decide no we're gonna or some of them end up staying inwards and staying within the community right is season two going to go deeper inwards or is it spreading out more is there going to be more people is it going to be bigger in any way like you're gonna have to find out <laughs> <laughs> All right, so then for generally from both of you, like what, what do you hope for? I mean, we've gotten this far in terms of indigenous storytelling. Where do you want to see it go? Like beyond just reservation dogs. Like what, what, what do you think is the next step? Where should, where, where should creators, uh, what should creators be aiming for? Mm. Would you like to go first? Sure. Mm -hmm. I would say that Indigenous creators should be aiming to tell whatever the hell story they want to tell. Because while we absolutely need stories about identity and who we are and our experiences and our history, I'd also love to see stories about whatever the hell we want to tell, like courtroom dramas or like indigenous queer two-spirit rom-coms and like every everything in between like having stories just for the sake of pure entertainment or if there's something deeper you want to talk about like whatever that is I hope that indigenous storytellers moving forward just create whatever gets them off <laughs> yeah I think I think indigenous storytellers should just like you know tell the truth you know, like Sterling, this is like his story. This is a work, like he took a lot from it. And so did every single person in that writer's room. You know what I mean? All of them brought so much to the table, so much of their personal experiences to the table. So it's like, just tell the truth and you can, you can see what happens with, like what happened with reservation dogs, you know? If you tell the truth. And like, when we all have our own truths, no matter, like there's no one idea of what like an indigenous person experience is supposed to be like, you know what I mean? Like we're urban setting, we're on the res, we're everywhere. You know what I mean? North, self, all over the place. So it's like, there's so many stories like if you're an indigenous storyteller your story is like that's that's your story you know what i mean that's not like you have to compare it to any other indigenous story or like that's that's just it so just write write act all of it do it just do it amazing all right thank that's all the time we have thank you thank you so much debris and deferro you guys you're you're, you're i loved 
Reservation Dogs. I can't wait to see you all in season two. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us for this incredible conversation. And, and I want to thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, as we continue to celebrate young creators at, here at TIFF, we hope that you will join us for this year's TIFF Next Wave Film Festival, which is Canada's largest film festival program by youth for youth, which will take place, by the way, on April 22nd, 224th, in person at the Tiff Bell Lightbox and online on digital Tiff Bell Lightbox. So for more information about the festival, please go to tiff.net forward slash next wave. Uh, there's going to be some exciting announce announcements about this year's festival uh, coming up in March. So look out for that. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Devry, Deferro. It's me, Gwich. I'm a P. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you for having us.